Out of all the football teams in the 2021 season, the Las Vegas Raiders were one of them. In hindsight, it's almost inconceivable to think of every tribulation that they had experienced. It was a year where adversity didn't break them, but somehow made them stronger. The ultimate underdog story full of flameouts, coaching turmoil, off-field drama rivaling the Oilers of 1993, and a simple coin of destiny. Las Vegas gambled with fire, and in the end, we only knew one thing. The Autumn Shroud is indeed a Raider. But first, a little backstory. The Raiders had gone through several seasons of, what's the best way to say it? Futility? A changing of identity? The Autumn Fart? A team that had spent years giving the middle finger to their own fans in Oakland left there in 2019 by giving them the middle finger on the way out. The Black Hole took their failure as well as you'd expect them to. Did you really have to shit on Derek Carr for the defense collapsing and a missed extra point? Speaking of collapses, that's what happened in 2020. Six and three start is promising enough, but not when the defense is such shit they ended the year losing five of six. Worst of all, they spent significant resources and draft capital in trying to fix said defense. None of it worked. The only option from here was to replace Yes Man Paul Genther with Gus Bradley, a man who understood how a defense worked in theory. The other was to kick the sloppy seconds of John Gruden to the curb, but that wasn't happening with the mammoth contract he was signed to. What did was trying to ask the Bears to trade Khalil Mack back to them. I'm sorry that you pissed away the draft picks you got from them Raiders, but no backsies! As they settled into Las Vegas, they got into some really cringe-worthy virtue signaling. And it wasn't their response to Carl Nassib saying he was gay. It was in the response to Derek Chauvin being found guilty on all charges. No, Raiders. George can't breathe. He's fucking dead! Mark Davis took responsibility for it, but it was just so goddamn tone deaf. It's a moot point, however. The real issue was in the executive branch. You could argue that high-ranking officials resigning after a major move is commonplace, but not several of them unexpectedly in succession. Especially when grumblings of tax issues are starting to bubble to the surface. This was a critical year for them. The first real foray into the Vegas experience. The black hole would descend onto the Death Star, or the Roomba, or whatever you wanted to call it to probably see some form of mediocrity. A team led by Derek Carr at quarterback. Eternally underrated, but there are some doubts as to if he's the man that can take them anywhere. Skill positions loaded with Josh Jacobs at running back, with Henry Ruggs going very fast, Hunter Renfro's majesty, and Darren Waller being a beast as usual at receiver and tight end. Max Crosby is also a damn good stud at defensive end. Raiders fans will say that he validates what the Gruden Mayock regime is doing, but that's more dumb luck. Or perhaps Mike Mayock was in Gruden's ear about him. He arguably was with Josh Jacobs. Week one was the beginning of a new season, and was what dreams are made of. The first game in Las Vegas with a capacity crowd on Monday Night Football. They were probably going to get crushed against Baltimore, but the Ravens are getting crushed with injury. They only lost two of their key players to ACL tears on back-to-back -back plays in practice. It would be a surprisingly tight matchup, the slings of hell thrown around for 60 minutes. But a predictable field goal by Justin Tucker deep into the fourth ended the match. Or did it? Baltimore suddenly forgot how to defense and Daniel Carlson kicked them into overtime. And then everything got absolutely fucked. And I mean fucked. Even more fucked. And then the Raiders... won. Take it as an appetizer of the madness to come. I don't mean what happened in Pittsburgh. The Steelers were flat out beaten because they couldn't cover a window and an injured TJ Watt ruined their pass rush. Week three was Miami in a grudge match for last year. No fitception to try and save you this time, Dolphins. It would be Jacoby Brissett for the last second touchdown to tie the game. You think that really matters? Of course it doesn't. Daniel Carlson is a fucking legend. With this kick, an unbelievable revelation had occurred. The Raiders were 3 and 0. God help us all. When you give Raider Nation oxygen, a grease fire spreads as fast as the fucking Omicron variant. It was somewhat quashed in a rather convincing loss in a home game in LA against the Chargers. But something sinister was about to be sent to their inbox. You've got mail. The NFL's investigation of the formerly Deadskins revealed some rather tasty tidbits about John Gruden. You may be asking how Gruden, who was on Monday Night Football at the time, sputtered to why banana his way into this scandal. That's because of this man, Bruce Allen. He and Gruden were partners in crime in the demolition of Tampa Bay. And they kept email correspondence, such as this lovely comment about DeMaurice Smith. He of, quote, 
Lips the size of Michelin tires. Apparently Gruden used that terminology to say someone's a liar, but considering past stereotypes, it won't work in the modern era. It dogged the Raiders heading into their match against Chicago, and they suffered the worst fate imaginable, allowing Justin Fields to gain confidence after being destroyed by a terrible offensive line. A three and two all should still be relatively calm, but then came more you emails. A shit ton mail. more. Where Gruden shit all over things the NFL pretends to embrace in modern times. Rightfully spitting on King Goodell's face by calling him a clueless anti-football pussy. And liberally throwing around the word faggot. You know, when one of his players publicly came out of the closet this past summer? Once all of this was revealed, he was fucked. There was no way he could have gone back into that locker room and have the respect of his players. But there was a silver and black lining. With these revelations, Mark Davis can get out of the buyer's remorse that is that awful contract they signed him to. With Chucky being due for a date with a firing squad, he chose to fall on his own sword and save himself just a shred of dignity. I just ask one question. Why was he the only one who suffered any repercussions for this bullshit? Once he was chucked out, the NFL said the emails were safe and they were the best organization in the world. They then gave themselves a medal for ending racism. Long live the Shield. The Raiders seemed all but finished as well. Their interim coach would be longtime special teams coordinator Rich Passaccia, who had long dreamed of being a head coach at this level, but not exactly in this kind of a situation. Here is where something incredible happened. The team didn't disintegrate as expected. They grew stronger. In matchups against Philadelphia and Denver, Las Vegas had played complete, tenacious, and effective football. The Raiders had shown that they weren't a fluke, but something greater. At 5-2, they were in good position for a playoff spot. But sometimes a good thing is as fleeting as a night on the town in Vegas. That brutal reminder involved Henry Ruggs, his girlfriend, and an incredible fuck-up. The meme went like this. Henry Ruggs go fast. Unfortunately, this guy gave it a meaning no one dared to dream of. There are only two words to describe his actions on the morning of November 2nd, 2021. Fucking idiot. After partying in Sin City and nowhere near capable of driving, he stepped into the driver's seat of his sports car and raced down the streets of Vegas suburbs at 156 miles per hour, while over double the legal limit for intoxication of 0.16%. This would prove to be a fatal decision. He slammed right into the back of a Toyota RAV4 and squealed to a stop hundreds of feet past the point of contact. Ruggs and his girlfriend escaped with minor injuries. Their intoxication may have actually saved them from death. 23-year-old Tina Tinter and her dog weren't as lucky. They survived the initial collision, but the car quickly catches fire. Tinter died in agony. She burned alive. With this heinous failure in judgment, the football career of Henry Ruggs is finished. It certainly is with the Raiders. He was cut the day of the accident. Ruggs currently sits in jail, facing multiple counts of DUI, manslaughter, and assault. I don't want to hear about healing, Derek Carr. The time for that is decades from now, not days after the tragedy. All we can do is mourn a life needlessly lost to one's careless actions. Football takes a backseat in this situation. After losing one of their star players, the Raiders somehow had to muster the will to play football. They had just finished up their bye week, so there was little time to try and process another heavy blow to their aspirations. The New York Giants were next, but the Silver and Black had trouble trying to play a consistent game. In a tribute to their former head coach, they collapsed Chucky style in the second half to lose a winnable contest. However, in a shocking twist, this wasn't the main headline on ESPN. It was Damon Arnett. Another colossal reach in the first round by Gruden himself. Not only was he having trouble adapting to play at the professional level, he had become a massive headache off the field. In 2020, Arnett had wrecked four rental cars in separate incidents. He had even been sued for a crash in front of the team's goddamn practice facility. And in a further testament to his sterling character, it all came to a head on an Instagram livestream, where he pointed guns at the camera and threatened to kill people in a rambling diatribe. The Raiders' hand was forced. They cut him after the Giants game. He'd bounce around a few practice squads, but that was before he was arrested for assault with a deadly weapon. And then again for drug charges. Truly a fucking idiot. 
Signing Deshaun Jackson as a rush replacement would hopefully ease the blow, but it wouldn't be in the next two games. To be fair, they were against the Chiefs and Bengals. And I can't believe I'm saying that about Cincinnati, but it had showed that they weren't near the top of the food chain. Even worse, they lost another one of their offensive leaders in Alec Ingold to a torn ACL. They were 5-5, five and five, fading fast, and things seemed bleak with Dallas on the way. But then, the greatest talisman a football team has ever received. A simple coin. It had predicted every single Raiders game correctly to this point. It had predicted that they would not only win against the Cowboys, but go 10-7 and seven and secure the seventh seed in the AFC. But first, they would have to make it past Dallas on Turkey Day. To call the game seven different shades of fucked up would be a gross understatement as to how it played out. There'd be some luck involved off the bat. There'd be an entire world's amount of yellow towels thrown onto the field for both teams. There'd be field goals aplenty. There'd be full starts called against the center. They'd be forced into overtime. And then the entirety of the Dallas Metro would want Anthony Brown dead. Who would win the day for the Raiders? You guessed it, Daniel Carlson. Car Daniel Carlson. Third time's a charm, Daniel Carlson. Can we just end this fucking game already? Here we go, this time for real, and it is delivered, good! The prophecy of chaos is no more. The prophecy of the coin is now steadfast. All hail the coin. It would last a week before losing in heartbreaking fashion to Washington. They took your coach by suspiciously leaking emails, and they took your talisman by means of a game-winning field goal. The cruelest irony. More painfully, it would take out Kenyon Drake for the remainder of the year. It would only get worse the next week. Las Vegas decided to take it upon themselves to do their team huddle on the midfield logo. The problem was they weren't at home. They were in Kansas City. And the gods do not take kindly to those that desecrate an opposing logo. The coin said they'd lose too, but probably not this awfully. A 5-2 start fell to 6-7 and, and a 5% chance to make the playoffs. The inevitable had seemed to be at hand. This time around, no one would blame the Raiders for falling off. Much stronger teams have fallen apart in the face of such adversity, but perhaps a little luck went their way. Headed into a game in Cleveland, a dangerous foe infiltrated their ranks. <coughs> None other than Corona Chan. A game that was supposed to be played on Saturday was forced to be pushed back to the majesty of Tuesday night. The Browns were without both of their quarterbacks, head coach, and 16 other players. If there were an opponent to regain your confidence, this was it. Unfortunately, Las Vegas had trouble getting past Cleveland's defense. Plus, the QB they brought in off the street did a solid job for the situation. In the fourth quarter, the Raiders were on the ropes. The Browns had the lead, and all they had to do was convert a third down to win the game. Vegas holds. Once they got the ball back, it was a repeat of week one. Methodically moved down the field on an exhausted defense and let Daniel Carlson do the rest. This the one counts, and the Raiders have won it! Back to 500. It wasn't pretty, but the season was saved. While Cleveland had lacked an offense due to COVID, Denver lacked an offense due to reasons of shit coaching and bad quarterback play. A defense that used to be known for giving up points and mass shut down Denver's JV offense in the second half. The Broncos only had eight first downs in the game. Says a bit about both teams, to be honest. The winning ways were back, but next week came the true test. The Colts in Indy. The Raiders were on the ropes. All Indianapolis had to do was win and they were in. But Vegas is a stubborn fucker. They refuse to die, even when everything is against them. When everyone has counted them out, the autumn wind somehow blows in the distance. The Colts should have had them dead to rights, but a resilient bunch manages to make it a game. And even if Indy manages to tie up the game with less than two minutes left, have you seen most of Las Vegas' games this year? They tend to have a flair for the dramatic, sometimes with the great hands of Hunter Renfro, but usually on the leg of Daniel Carlson. Carlson from 33, his kick is good! Raiders win! It was divine. A Raider legend smiled down from above in this one. Earlier in the week, former head coach John Madden passed on to the great gridiron field in the sky. Another devastating loss for a team that had suffered nothing but them. This time, however, it wasn't shocking, but comforting. We remember the good times with him, not past traumas. This moment would be ruined by Nate Hobbs. 
a rookie corner who had done phenomenal work in fortifying their secondary. Learning nothing from what happened to Henry Ruggs, he was arrested for DUI. Fortunately, the situation was settled and nothing serious happened. Thank God. With this in mind, they return home for a date with destiny. The Los Angeles Chargers. All of the marbles are on the line. Winner moves on to the playoffs. The season ends for the loser. If they tie, they both make it. Thank the Steelers for that one. The black hole was at a fever pitch. And they hoped that the coin would be wrong again for prophecy to be fulfilled. And it predicted a Raiders loss. Throughout the game, Las Vegas was about to become one massive party scene. The autumn wind was blowing again. Life itself had sprung anew as the Raiders had a 15-point lead with eight minutes left in the game. However, life always doesn't go according to plan. The Chargers have an offense that tends to go balls to the wall in these kinds of situations. As Vegas couldn't seal the deal, they have to go back on defense. All they need is one stop. Just one. Herbert. Firing, and it is going to be caught in the end zone by the big body, Mike Williams. They paid homage to last year's defense. They couldn't stop them. They failed to hold the lead. All of Pittsburgh is now shitting itself. Overtime awaits. There would be field goals. And more field goals. But the Raiders are in a situation of strength. Pounding the rock with Josh Jacobs to get them within a sniff of field goal range to win the game. The Silver and Black were allegedly fine with settling for the tie, but then came the greatest moment of all. A timeout by the Chargers to regroup. You could say them saying the timeout galvanized them was mere gamesmanship, but LA's mistake can't defend against the run for shit. Josh Jacobs punishes them in kind. And guess what? They're in field goal range. Snap good, hold good, and Raiders in, Chargers out, Steelers in. Carlson makes his fifth game winner of the season. All of Pittsburgh unclenches their anuses. The Las Vegas Raiders, after a year full of drama, twists and turns, turbulence and tribulation, had done something remarkable. They had made the playoffs. The coin was wrong again, but in doing so, its prophecy had been fulfilled. A longtime rival was forced to eat shit. They ended the year on a four-game winning streak, a 10-7 record, and the sixth seed in the AFC. All of it with a point differential of minus 65. That's the most impressive part. Their opponent in the wildcard game, the Cincinnati Bengals, another team of destiny. A group that had been broken for years thanks to self-destructing in the 2016 playoffs found life again. It was as if it was magic. Burrow to Chase was a deadly combination that left many secondaries destroyed in its wake. Their defense sneakily underrated. The ultimate test would be coming up for the autumn wind. This match would take place in the hostile confines of Paul Brown Stadium. Cincinnati was favored, but Las Vegas has been known to play spoiler. Just look at what they did this past season. Unfortunately, this is where cold reality came to slap them across the face. The Raiders struggled to do anything for most of the first half. And then came zebra-striped controversy. Tries to keep it alive, scrambles. Throws it back in the end zone, but was he out of bounds first or is it a touchdown? Under the NFL's rules, this play should have been called dead after the whistle was blown. For whatever reason, the officials saw Joe Burrow was out of bounds when he clearly wasn't. The Raiders defense considered it a dead ball and allowed a touchdown to Tyler Boyd. So while technically the right decision was made and the play stood, it was still a terrible call by the official. No wonder why this ref crew wasn't brought back for any future playoff games. The fortunate thing is that the Raiders still had a chance. With Derek Carr guiding them to a rapid fire touchdown to end the half, they were only down by seven. However, that's all the offense could really muster. They'd play hard, they'd do everything they could to win. But no matter what, it just never seemed to be enough. The Raiders would make field goals, yet the Bengals would counter with their own. It was Raiders 19, Bengals 26 deep into the fourth quarter. This was their last chance. A nice deep spiral to Darren Waller gives them life. It takes them to the red zone. Another first down by Zay Jones gets them to the nine. But since his defense holds firm, they stop them on second and third down. Here it is. All the marbles on fourth down. The season comes down to this. It is Carr in zone. Intercepted. 
The worst part about a real-life underdog story is that they usually don't play out like a Hollywood screenplay. In those films, they go on to win the game, the girl, and the glory, but none of that happened here. With that pick, the Raiders' season was over. It was an outstanding campaign, all things considered. But unfortunately, they were bested on this day. If it eases the sting, the Bengals would go on to the Super Bowl, but it means nothing for Las Vegas. The final casualties of a season of turmoil had to occur. Mike Mayock had always been tied to the hip of John Gruden. And with the season over, the Raiders wanted a fresh start. His firing had sealed their legacy as an entirely predictable disaster. Look at these draft classes. All three of their 2019 first round picks had their fifth year options declined. If it weren't for Max Crosby and Hunter Renfro, their draft classes would have given them next to nothing. Worst of all, most of these first round picks were insane reaches at the time. Gruden had final say in picks, so his talent assessment was as god-awful as it had been. At least Mike can go back to television, unlike a certain partner of his. The other price to pay was Rich Bisaccia. His excellent motivating should have gotten him another chance with a silver and black. But like with Mayock, Las Vegas chose to go in a different direction. He got shafted. He was let go of duty. He would latch on in Green Bay as a special teams coordinator, but he deserved so much better. To replace them, they chose to pay homage to the tuck rule and try to skin the Patriots alive. Their new head coach is the cancer of Josh McDaniels. All of Denver is currently cackling like hyenas. Despite my cynicism, the 2022 Raiders should be many things. Perhaps playoff contenders, especially with a big time wideout in Devontae Adams acquired. A strong pass rushing team with Chandler Jones at it. They'll hopefully draft better. However, the 2021 season was a special one for Las Vegas. In both the good and the bad. A team full of complexity, turmoil, tragedy, and glory in a single package. They're a soap opera equaling the 93 Oilers and the bickering Bills. And their story will make for a damn good 30 for 30 in the future. I can't wait until that comes out. This one counts, and the Raiders have won it! Las Vegas is still alive. 16-14 as Carlson hits the game winner.